All right. Well, this is the mindfulness practice group here. We are continuing our conversation about addictions. And uh, we're talking about addictions and defense and habits of behavior and speech that we know cause us suffering. So the way um, we've been using the word addiction in the past, I want to say four months, five months, six months, however long we've been playing with this theme here at Flying Cloud, um, we're using the word addictions in kind of the broadest possible sense. In other words, the more obvious form of addiction, like addiction to gambling or alcohol or drugs or something like that. But we're also noticing a little more subtly, right, through our, through our mindfulness practice, that our lives are filled with habits, mostly unconscious, habits that have a harmful potential for us, right? Habits of speech, habits of behavior, um, and even habits of thought, habits of perception that we're just hooked on, we're just habituated to doing that actually hurt. They hurt in large ways or they hurt in very subtle small ways. But we're looking at what we call addiction, which is just destructive habits continued, even though we know they're destructive, through the lens of um, seeing them as defenses. That at one point, at their genesis, these habits, these destructive um, what are now destructive addictions were at the time um, circumstantial adaptation, skillful means even, they were the best option that we might've had at one point in our lives when the habit began to be formed and what they were defenses against, what they were designed to do when we first started picking up these habits was to protect us from having powerfully afflictive experience. That is to say, powerfully painful emotions, right? If you, if you look at the genesis, the origin story um, of some of your more destructive habits, you'll say, oh yeah, I guess at the very beginning, I picked up that habit, that habit of behavior, that habit of speech, that habit of perception, um, because at the time it seemed to be the best option that I had to insulate me from a profoundly uncomfortable experience. It was a defense. I offered it as a shield to try to keep me safe. When we start relating to addiction and the examination that we all are doing here into our own addictive patterns, uh, that means our starting place is a place of softness, kindness, because we realized there was suffering. There was somebody who was hurt and who didn't have any better options, right? That's supposed to soften supposed to soften us to start with, uh, the person I'm looking at is in pain and was in pain, right? That's the movement of compassion. And then further to begin to understand, oh yeah, there's a reason. There's a reason that that habit is there. So um, we're saying all of this because we want to disarm ourselves. Uh, we want to disarm the judge. We want to disarm ourselves when we begin this investigation so that we don't go in, that we don't go inside of ourselves, we don't go internally with a critic, with a judge or with a weapon. So we're wanting to understand that which we see. It's central to the spirit of mindfulness practice, but it seems important to notice. Yeah. Okay, so what I'd like to offer you this morning is um, a short quote from Dr. Gabor Mate, I've been quoting him for these past few months, we've been talking about this. Um, he has a, uh, he's written a lot about addiction. He's posted oftentimes on whole, wholehearted.org, but healing trauma, trauma and addiction is one of his specialties. Uh, Gabor Mate is spelled um, G-A-B-O-R, last name M-A-T-E. I, I recommend you Google him. He says, it is impossible to understand addiction without asking what relief the addict finds or hopes to find in the drug of addictive behavior. All addictions are an attempt to solve a problem, and that problem is emotional pain. If people are addicted to self-soothing behaviors, it's only because they're 
in their formative years, they did not receive the soothing that they needed. The problem is that most of our beliefs about ourselves and the world are formed before we have any words for it. They're pre-verbal. So if I asked any of you here, what happened to you? You can tell me what happened to you when you were seven years old, but you couldn't tell me what happened to you when you were seven days old. And yet what happened to you when you were seven days old is what shows up in your life as your beliefs about yourself and your beliefs about the world. That's what we have to overcome when it comes to dealing with our addictions. And that's what makes it so difficult. It's a beautiful quote, and there's a lot of things we could play with there, but I want to stay with his, uh, his first statement about an addictive behavior being an attempt to solve a problem, the problem of emotional pain. And so if we want to understand with compassion is the word that I use, I want to understand with compassion, what I recognize is somebody is seeking relief. They are seeking relief from emotional pain. So even my small addictions, habits of thought, habits of speech, the way I move around the space of my apartment, the way that I drive my car, the people that I choose to bring into my life over and over and over, all of them are going to on some level be designed to insulate me from pain because a habit is something that repeats itself because it seems to work, right? So if I continue to go back to doing something, it obviously is effective, or at least once was, and I will therefore seek it out over and over. And what Dr. Mate is talking about is when we're very, very, very young, the ages we can't even remember cognitively, um, we don't have a sense of skillful means or advocacy agency in the world. We're just a ball of experience. And all we're doing is moving from that which hurts to that which does not. Right? Emotional pain or physical pain, of course, is all we really have at that age. So, so many of our habits go all the way, all the way, all the way back. But how they manifest for us now as mindfulness practitioners is, where do I notice emotional pain in my life? And what do I notice that I use to try to insulate myself from it? Because, of course, as you know, so often the thing that we use to insulate ourselves from it causes much, much more harm in our lives than the actual experience itself, right? Our fear of the thing is worse than the thing. That's the way this stuff tends to work, right? Okay, so um, the experiential I would like for us to do today, I'm gonna kind of guide us through, this is kind of a, I guess it's almost a guided meditation. It's really more of, it's really more of a, th uh, a thought experiment perhaps, but it has a self-reflective quality to it is I'm going to encourage you, and I don't think you need to do a, do pen and paper for this or have, have a screen in front of you. I think we can just take a second to sit up straight. You can kind of close your eyes, and I'm just going to guide you through a couple ideas here as, as an experiential. And I want you to just sort of experience the best you can um, the questions that I'm going to ask, the, the, the insights I'm inviting you into, just sort of experience them in your body the best you can, right? We're gonna sort of just do a thought experiment around um, addictive behavior and emotion, okay? Then we'll do something else, but let's start with this. Uh, first, I invite you to just kind of ground yourself, just take a couple of breaths. To just locate yourself in the space. Find your posture. Remember your breath. We start this way, folks, to give us just a little bit of safety. Right? To remind ourselves that we are being cared for by our own kindness as we begin any kind of introspective work. We're okay. Create a, a space of safety before we start to look. <clears throat> so I invite you to call to mind, just pick something um, in your life that you recognize as a habit, an addiction, a defense, a 
pattern, something that you notice that you do repeatedly, that you think causes some harm, that you have a hard time relinquishing. Right? We can use the word addiction here if we want. Just pick one. Pick one of your, pick one of your addictions. Call that to mind. And then when you've landed on one to use, it doesn't matter which one you use really. Ask yourself, what feeling is that addiction or defense intended to protect you from? Can you see in yourself what emotion? What experience, what pain is that defense trying to protect you from? See if you can find that feeling. See if you can find a name for that feeling. And then you think you have a feeling identified, I invite you to make a choice to feel that emotion. Even if it's just a little bit, make a choice to feel for just a few breaths, the emotion underneath that creates that defense. And as you are allowing yourself to hold that experience, as you are noticing that emotion, as you're letting yourself have it, I invite you to recognize in full awareness, this emotion is what my addiction is intended to protect me from. This emotion is what creates the defense. This emotion is what my addiction is intended to protect me from. This emotion is what creates the defense. Right, that's all, just see it. There's no judgment here. There's nothing to do. There's no problem to solve. Just see. Right? Just this seeing is what breaks the pattern. Okay, and then finally, because this is a mindfulness class setting, I invite you to remember that the emotion that we are experiencing is impermanent. Notice how it changes. Right? Notice how the emotion that you're experiencing rises and falls and waxes and wanes. It becomes solid and it dissolves. Just remember that the experience you are having, that you're trying to defend yourself against having, that experience itself is impermanent. It's changing and dissolving. Okay. That's it. Okay. So let's uh, ease back. He's back together. What we're doing here, when we do this kind of thing together, it's sometimes helpful to do it with others, just to know that we're not alone in doing this kind of work, just to feel the support of a group. But really what we're doing is what Dr. Mate is describing. We're acknowledging the fact that the pattern of avoidance 
that I call addiction or defense is something that I come by honestly. Like there was pain there. And so I defended against it. Of course, this is what human beings do. Right? There isn't a pathology here. It makes sense that that's what a human being would do. But that simple experiment we just did of going, hold on a minute, I noticed that there's a defense. What's the feeling underneath it? What is the emotion underneath that I'm really trying not to have? Well, I can identify that and I can invent, um, I can invent a setting like a mindfulness setting or like a meditation setting. I can invent a little container where it's safe for me to do that for three breaths, for five breaths, for five minutes, for 10 minutes. I can create that all by myself and I can make a choice. I can feel the emotion. I can just feel it. I can just touch it. Suddenly the defense is gone, do you see? I'm willing to feel the thing. There's no more defense. There's no more guard. There's no more avoidance. There's no more pattern of avoidance. There's no more addiction in that moment. I'm just willing to, oh, there it is. <gasps> There's the fear or the loneliness or the anger or the confusion or the despair, or whatever that thing was I was defending myself against. I made a choice to go into it and go, oh, there you are. I recognize you. You're the thing I've been defending against. You're why the chocolate bar shows up or the extra glass of wine shows up or why I'm a workaholic or what, right? <gasps> there you are. I see you're the thing that creates the defense. I get it. Do you feel that in that moment, the pattern, the autopilot of defense is gone? It's just gone <gasps> because I'm going one level more deeply into my own experience. I'm willing to just have that experience, right? Now, I realize this is a short experiential and it's just designed to show us the ideas. And I also realize that after doing something like this, that the patterns of addiction reassert themselves because we're habituated beings. I understand that. But hopefully you can kind of feel, right? In your heart of hearts as we're doing this, oh yeah. If I did that same exercise, if I did that same idea of, oh, here's the defense, what is it protecting me from? Right, there you are. I'm willing to feel you. I'm willing to be in relationship with you. If I continued to do that, if I did that with frequency, if I did that with depth, I would break the defense. I would change the defense. The defense would evolve because the thing it's there to defend me against is different. It's just not the same anymore. So of course the pattern would change, right? So what we're doing here is, yes, we change the behavior, but we're digging down into the roots to see how the behavior comes to be. This is what mindfulness practice affords us, right? Is the power, the agency of stable, non-judgmental, kind presence that allows us to look underneath the autopilot of speech and behavior, habituated thinking to go, what gives rise to you? How can I find those little areas of suffering, meet them with the kindness that they're asking for, heal that wound, and then therefore the pattern isn't necessary anymore, right? It's actually very simple. It's not easy, but the mechanism is actually very simple. Let's go down, down in. So um, that was just our experiential today. And so I'm going to turn off the recording for all of, all of those who are watching this um, on YouTube. It's wonderful that you've joined us. And um, please join us. We meet every month uh, here on Flying Cloud Zen at the Mindfulness Practice Group. We do stuff just like this. We're a pretty friendly bunch, so hope, hope to see you soon.